series, um, and then we'll begin the first week of the new year with a new series. Um, hopefully, you've been blessed um, by the last uh, series about falling. Man, it's part of life, but you don't have to stay there. You can get up again. So we'll wrap that up tomorrow morning. Tonight, we're going to do part two of session six. And again, thank you, admin, for your um, making handouts available, hard copies for us. If you need a copy, let us know. We'll get you a copy. But then those who are online, we could download them. So we're going to look at part two of session six. In part one, we were talking about there are times when the body of believers, we have to be tough. We have to be tough, especially when we're dealing with external opposition. This battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's principalities. Satan is behind it, and he is always coming against the people of God. And if we're not careful, we would turn on each other instead of thrusting all of our efforts, um, our strength, our faith, uh, as it relates to spiritual warfare. If we're not careful, we'll turn on each other instead of recognizing the real enemy. So last week we talked about you got to know when to be tough. And again, uh, saying why the devil is bothering me has never stopped him from bothering you. Uh, why is he picking on me? Why am I going through so much? Why is he out to destroy my family? Why does it seem like I can't get ahead? I'm always dealing with something. That has nev never slowed him down. And so you have to know um, that you got to be tough when it comes to dealing with external opposition. And the body of Christ, the people of God, the church has to come together to fight one enemy. Okay, And so that's what Paul was talking about. Uh, uh, last uh, session and so today we want to there's a shift there's a transition he's in the same passage but now there's a turn and so now he's talking about tenderness and he begins in verse 1 of chapter 2 and notice how Paul begins he says so if so if there is. Now what Paul is doing is that Paul is not using a word that speaks to possibilities. You know, it's like uh, if this happens, then that will happen. Or if this does not happen, then there's no way that is going to happen. That speaks of possibilities. But what Paul is using a word that he is literally saying since, because. And so what Paul is doing now, he's using a word that speaks of the certainty. And Paul says, since this is the case, and he's going to go down a list of the certainties which should serve as a source of motivation for us to be tender with one another. Okay. There's no such thing that you cannot do what God is asking you to do. <laughs> you, if, now, you may not want to do it, but there's no such thing that you can't do what God is asking you to do. And, and Paul here, he's talking about, again, believers coming together. He's talking about us learning how to be affectionate towards each other for one common cause. Okay. Unity is never automatic. Okay. You have to be intentional if you are going to be on the same page. Okay. Whether that is in a, in a relationship with someone, whether that is with the congregation, whether it is with your finances, what have you. You got to be intentional. Uh, and so what Paul is saying now, 
Now, you, you, I've already shared with you that if you are going to know when to be tough, okay, it's going to take everybody coming together to fight one common enemy. Now he's talking about, okay, if you are going to get along with everybody, then you're going to have to learn how to treat everybody with the same type of um, emotion. And he's talking about tender affection. Okay. Now, if it, Paul, he, he reminds us, he says now, since God has always been tender with you, you can be tender with people. He says, because the tenderness that I am exhorting you to display, it flows from the one who is infinitely tender. Okay. I want you to think back at least at one time okay, when God had a right to crush you, but he chose to be tender with you. So that, that's what Paul has in the back of his mind. You remember his life, right? How he was totally against Jesus and the things of Jesus. I mean, he, he, it was his business to destroy the Christian movement, the movement of Christ. But the Lord did not destroy him. And so Paul is indebted to the Lord. And Paul knows that whatever you owe God is payable to God's people. Okay. You don't need to be tender with God. But you need to be tender with God's people. Okay. So Paul, now he gives us this if statement. And again, these are, th these are not possibilities. These are certainties. And as such, this, this should motivate us, and it can motivate us, uh, to for there to be unity throughout, throughout the body of Christ. So now Paul, he starts with giving us the basis for unity. And he says, so if there or since there is, and now he's going to go down a list of our motivation. The first motivation is when you think about your relationship with Jesus, okay, it should encourage you regardless of what you are going through or regardless of where you are. When you think about your relationship with Jesus Christ, your relationship with Jesus Christ empowers you to get along with anybody. <laughs> because he is not simply tolerating you. Okay. You're not frustrating him. Okay. It is, it is, it, God does not find it impossible to get along with us. Okay. And we have to know he does it from his mercy. Okay. If we could learn how to deal with one another the way God deals with us, then we'll be able to do what God has called us to do. Okay. Let me give an example of that. The reason why God does not condemn you is because he's already judged Christ. Okay. So he refuses to put him back on the cross. Okay. Every time you come against him, every time you, you stray from him, all of that, you just go down the list. He refuses to do that because there's no reason for him to crucify him again. There's no reason for him to die again. So whenever... We're told to do something of God and all that. And in this case, you know, strive for unity. When you think about your relationship with others, it should in your relationship with the Lord, it should encourage you and motivate you in your relationship with other people. Okay. So what is it about our relationship with Jesus Christ uh, that should encourage us? We'll look at these scripture references. Let's first look at uh, um, Philippians chapter 1, uh, verse uh, number 29. Okay. Verse 29. Chapter 1. Verse 29. C can we read that together? Read. For it has been granted to you 
that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also what? Suffer for his sake. Now, some people are hard to get along with, right? Okay. But you don't have to let them know that they're hard to get along with. Because God, God, God doesn't shake his head at you. And nor does his angel say, God, you know what? You need to send somebody else for this one because he's a booger. No. Yes, people are challenging, but you don't have to let them know that they are challenging. Okay. Because some of your suffering for his sake may be dealing with difficult people without letting them know how difficult it is to deal with them. You may be the only somebody that they have not heard how difficult it is to deal with. Everybody else since day one been telling them. Out of all my kids, you the bad one. You <laughs> Why can you be like, you see? So that may be your suffering. Okay. And your encouragement is the relationship you have with Jesus Christ. Okay. So this encouragement. But then look at even chapter 3. Go to chapter 3. We're not going to read all these scripture references, but we're going to read some of them, and I want you to read them devotionally. Look at chapter 3, and then listen to verses 9 and 10. And here he's talking about the blessing of knowing Christ and then the blessing of being found in Christ. Do we have verse number 9? We set? Okay, let's read that together. And be found where? In him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Okay. Was Jesus glad to die for you? Yeah. Yeah. And so in a moment you'll see sometimes you and I have to die so that somebody else can live. That is why it's an, in, it's an indictment on us when we are selfish. We're living when we're selfish. You die sometimes by being selfless. Though he was equal with God, he thought it not what? Robbery. And he humbled himself. Okay. Even unto the cross. So, so, th this is, so this is our encouragement. You're not doing anything that Jesus hadn't already done for you. Remember that. You are not the first, okay? You are not doing anything for anyone else that, that he has not already done for you. And he's going to make sure that you don't outdo him. You're going to do it, but you are not, you would never do it as often as he has done it for you. So that's our encouragement, okay? Number two, let's, let's go ahead and move. Uh, look at the, uh, the, the consolation of love. So, so Paul, he moves now. He says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ. And what again, what he's saying is that since there is encouragement in Christ, knowing Christ, being found in Christ, and that is knowing Christ, is that you're not doing anything that he is not doing for you. The challenge becomes... And it was a challenge for those disciples, and that is we're willing to do certain stuff for Jesus, but we're not willing to do it for each other. Remember the foot washing scenario? They would wash Jesus' feet, but they wouldn't wash each other's feet. And you and I can't, we can't have this cherry-picked 
type of, of service in that we'll do stuff for certain Christians, but we won't do it for others. All right? He did not come to what? Be, be served. He came to what? Okay. Say amen so I know you're breathing. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> so he says, <laughs> so he since there is encouragement in Christ, now he moves to, you can even find consolation uh, in the love of Christ. Okay. Back up to, again, uh, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Okay. Let me know when we're ready. We're there? Okay. Look at verse 7. I'm going to read this one, okay? It, it, it is right for me. To feel this way about you all. Because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace. Both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Verse number 8. For God is my witness. How I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So here's the motivation here, okay? This affection and this love that, that you and I are to show and share with one another flows from the love of Christ that he has extended towards us. Okay? God is not asking you to do something and, and you are on E. The same love that he is loving you with, you are to take that same love, okay? And, and, and what he's reminding us is that whatever God is doing for you, it shouldn't bottleneck. It shouldn't end with you. It shouldn't end with me. But it is to what? Flow, okay? So, so there is this consolation of love. Okay? He is ours and we are his. So as it relates to other believers, you know how we sing that song, you pray for me and I pray for you, okay? So, 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 so you belong to me and I belong to you. So when I use my gifts, guess who benefits? You. And when you use your gift, I benefit. You belong to me, I belong to you. We have to think that way. So this consolation of love, we, we, we are comforted the fact that Christ, he loves us. And so, therefore, we want to be like him, and so we love one another. Okay, let me move on. Then the fellowship of the Spirit. Paul says, since there is encouragement in Christ, and since there is comfort from love, and since there is participation in the Spirit. The fellowship of the Spirit is what he is talking about. And so Paul is saying the fellowship that you and I enjoy is not man-made, is spirit-produced. There is no way people who are opposite of each other can get along. There's no way people who really don't know each other can come together and it's as though we've always known each other. It's spirit-produced fellowship. And then those same scripture references there. You remember when in Paul says in Romans 8 and 26, we're talking about when it comes to praying with two weeks to know what we should pray for about the Holy Spirit because we're in this partnership. Okay? He is in fellowship with us and we are in fellowship with him. That he helps us in our weakness. So then we are to help one another in our weaknesses. So there will be, there will always be members in the body of Christ who are not at the same place or on the same level, okay? But we're in fellowship together, okay? Do you think you're on the same level as the Holy Spirit? No. And yet he maintains the fellowship. So the fellowship there. And then lastly, the affection and mercy. Since there is affection and sympathy okay. now 
this is where we get this word. This is why we raised the question of the statement, knowing when to be tough. Talked about last week, now knowing when to be gentle. This, this, is, this is what Paul is talking about here. Now he's, he's about to talk about tenderness. So this affection and mercy, he says, and that is Paul is reminding us that the same mercy that you have received, you are to what? Blessed are the merciful, okay? They will what? Obtain what? Mercy. Isn't that something? It's amazing to me that we want God to have mercy on us, but we struggle sometimes having mercy with one another. Have you ever told God you would not do something anymore if he got you out this time? Mm -hmm. How's that working for you? And then, you know, we have an example of this when, when uh, Peter says to Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? And, and he wants to do, you know, I, I've done it seven. Yeah, seven. Now Jesus is saying, really, you don't, you really don't want to keep up with how much mercy you're showing other people. Because then God will keep up with how many times he's showing mercy to you. And see, that, that, that's how you know it's a mindset. And we're going to get to that in a moment. So here, so Paul has laying the foundation. Thi this is the basis for unity. Th this is why we should be tender with each other. This is, this is how we can be tender, tender with each other. Look at the statement of summation. And in essence, what Paul is doing is that Paul, he is starting out with the positive. Okay. He is starting out helping us to know how blessed we are to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he's about to give us this imperative to do something. Okay. He's already given us the motivation sense. Sense is encouragement, partnership, and all that. So look at the statement of summation. Be quick to first mention the blessings we share before telling people what they are supposed to be doing as fellow believers. Okay. So now here is this Im imperative, this command. And it's interesting what, what the command is. He's given us all those motivations. Now listen to what he says. Complete my joy. Complete my joy. Or fulfill my joy. So is Paul saying... That if these people don't do this, his jaw will be incomplete. No. But what he is saying is, if we do this for one another, okay, it fills us with joy. <laughs> so, 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 so here again, you get something from me, I get something from you. And the something that I get from you, okay, it fills me with joy. And the something you get from me fills me with joy. So this is why it's important to know that whenever you are being tender at the right time, okay, it helps people with their joy. There again, you never know, okay, you never know why God has encouraged you to be tender in somebody's life. You, don't, you never know their journey. You just never know. So now Paul's the same. And in essence, the statement, what he's really doing is that Paul's well-being is tied to the unity and growth of the church. His well-being. Your well-being, my well-being, okay, 
is tied to one another. And when you are growing, that gives me joy. <laughs> and when I'm growing, it gives you joy. Because what you are, how you're using your gifts and your passions, I benefit from that. And my using my gifts and passions, you benefit from that. So that's what Paul is saying. Is that when we do these particular things, it has a way of filling us with joy. Now, if, if I can use this um, this in a metaphorical sense. So Paul, as a preacher, pastor, is saying that his well-being is tied to the unity and the growth of the church. That is, Paul, he's laid the foundation for this church, right? Paul has preached to these people. Paul has taught these people. And, and when Paul hears that they're getting along, how do you think that makes him feel? How does he make him feel when they're fighting each other? So what Paul is saying, when I hear that you all are getting along, that you all are encouraging one another in the faith, Paul says that makes me feel good. He says, but the opposite of that is also true. That if I hear that there are, there are, there are, there are rivalries and bickering and squabbles, Paul says that breaks my heart. So here's the example. As a parent, how does it make you feel when your children are getting along with each other and are growing individually? It makes you feel good. Does it make you feel good? So that's what Paul is saying here. So these examples here as parents and even as parishioners, now, there are two scripture references we do want to look at here. You don't have these, but I'm going to give them to you. Uh, John, third letter, 3 John, um, line number 4. Let's go there. This is toward the uh, it's, um, one book before Jude, um, 3 John. And again, it's just one chapter, so you don't, you know, you just have 3 John 4. Look at verse 4. So John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So, so in a spiritual sense, it makes sense, right? But even in a physical sense, it makes sense. And so even as parishioners, what Paul is, and here again, you remember Paul is writing to the church. He's talking to what? Parishioners. So Paul says, your unity and your growth is filling me up with joy, okay? And so he says, that, that, that is the reason why I want to encourage you to continue okay, in how you treat one another. That's what he is saying here. Okay. Look at the statement of summation. Like-mindedness completes unity. Unity. Okay. Question so far. Okay. Listen to the command. The command is simply, fulfill my joy. Complete my joy. That's the command. Now, how do you think these people feel about Paul? They love him, don't they? And when Paul says, make me happy, make me proud, fulfill my joy, th that, that, is, that is a positive, that is not a negative. But he is already, he is already encouraged and, in, and motivated them in this. Now here again, Paul is saying, now what I'm asking you to do for me, I'm also asking you to do for each other. Now he's about, he, he's about to talk about 
um, examples or expressions of unity. Oh, the other uh, passage I'm going to give you, Proverbs 10 and 1. Write that one down, okay? Proverbs 10 and 1. But now with these expressions of unity, now, now he, here, now I want you to think about what Paul is saying here, and I want you to think about uh, I, is, it, is it hard for you not to be hard? And if it's hard for you not to be rough on people and hard on people, then chances are there's something missing here. Okay. Look at uh, the, the um, from the B clause of verse 2 through verse 4. Okay. So the A clause... will simply fulfill my joy. That's, that's, that's the command there. That's the, and, again, and again, Paul here, he is talking about unity. Okay. And if there's going to be unity, th there has to be tenderness. Okay. If, if we're tough on each other, guess what? We, we have people who, uh, who, who are afraid of us. And there is no fellowship. Okay. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you have a child and the uh, child gets in trouble at school. And they're going to say, whatever you do, please don't call my mama. Tough. Okay. Tough love. And tough love has its place, right? But then there are times when when it hurts more to be tender, but then it, it will also help them because they expect you to be tough. But by being tender, you actually help them through because the pain, they're already feeling the pain. And so that's why you got to know when to be tough and tender, discernment of the spirit here. But in these cases, Paul is literally talking about this tenderness. He's, th he's talking about tenderness, affection here. So, so if there's going to be unity, and, and he gives us the basis for it, all that Christ has done for you, okay. when, when you are unified, I, I have joy. And now he says, okay, these are some expressions of unity. These are several uh, attributes, if you will, that you would want to pursue Okay, so that you can possess them so that there will be unity uh, within the family. So let's, let's, look at, let's look at these. Again, verse 2, but the B clause there. Okay. By being of the same mind. Okay. Now, the, what, what mind do you think Paul is talking about? Is it his mind? It's Christ. Right. Now, later Paul would say, follow me as I what? Follow Christ. So Paul knows that there are some people who will follow him, but they won't follow Christ. That's the challenge. When, when people are closer to you than the God you pointed them to. And they'll do whatever you say, but they won't do what God says. That's the challenge of making disciples. It's kind of like you raise your children, and you don't raise them with the idea that you're going to always be there with them. Right? So we have to cut the apron string. You, you can't raise them like we're going to be 116 years old. We can't do that. But if we're not careful, we will cripple them.
by doing everything for them. Okay? And not knowing when to be tough and when to be tender. Right? So Paul, he puts, he's always challenging them. He says, now follow me. He says, but as I follow Christ. Okay? Don't put all your faith in me is what Paul is saying. Paul said, I am not the Christ. So follow me as I, but here is the challenge. If you don't know what Christ is like, then I can lead you astray. So, so, so it behooves every disciple to know Christ, right? And to be able to identify unchristlike. Okay. So, so this, this, Paul is saying this Christ-like mindset. And I looked at this, and I'm like, this is my first time getting it like this. So, so here's, the tr here, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, he is saying, uh, get your head on straight. He says, whenever there are rivalries and squabbles and fighting among the body, he says, because you don't have your head on straight. Who would, who would, who would know the person is not the enemy and still fight them? Somebody who had a head on straight. But Paul is literally saying, get your head on straight. And he said, if you are not Christ-like minded, your head is, on, is not on straight. That's what he is saying. So now Paul talks a lot about the mind of Christ and about being transformed by the what? Let this mind be in, there was what? In what? He's talking about the mind. So he's literally saying, get your head on straight. If we see someone whose head is on backwards, we know something wrong, right? <laughs> so, 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 so Paul is saying, so Paul is saying, so he said, now when the congregation again, when the congregation is like the world, it means their head is not on straight. You expect rivalries in the world, right? Squabbles on the job. You expect that. But not within the household of faith is what he is saying. Get your head on straight. So this first B is Christ-like minded. That's what he is saying here. Okay. He says, by being of the same mind. So, so that's that's Christ-like, that, that's 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 Christ-like mindset. Now, um, to be Christ-like, Christ-like uh, minded. Again, he came to serve, but not what be served. Though he was equal with God, he thought of not robbery, and he humbled himself. Right. Uh, in the beginning, the Word became flesh, and so, so we see all of this where he is steadily coming down. He is, he is always who he is, but he is always coming down. Okay. So, so, so he, he presents uh, to us a model of selflessness, right? He never used his power for himself. He always used it for others. And one commentary says, one of the reasons why it's challenging for the body of Christ to be selfless is because we live in a culture of selfies. Why do we take selfies? <laughs> 
and 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 metaphorically speaking, I think what the author is talking about, we live in a culture of selfies, is that we 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 really do something for ourselves and then we think, but it's for others too. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about those of us who are studied. I'm talking about people who are not studied. It was a culture of selfies. But Christ, again, he was selfless. Okay? So it's a challenge for us. It's, it's a challenge for us to be selfless. Okay? So, so, so the first one, the first one is Christ-like minded. But then the second one is be sensitive. He says, he says, um, ha- having the same love. Now, now, so he is saying, just like I love myself, I love you. Right? And just like I wouldn't do that to myself, I'm not going to do that to you because it's one body. And, 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 and the hand doesn't punch the eye. Right? So, so, so he says here, he says, he says, having the same love. And so in essence, what he is saying here is be sensitive to others. That is, be concerned about the interest of others is what he's really saying here. And he, he goes on and he, and he expands it a bit more by saying, being in full accord and of one mind. That is to say, if this doesn't make sense for me to do it to myself, how can it make sense for me to do it to somebody else? It doesn't make sense. But if we are if we are insensitive to others, we would do to others what we would not do to ourselves. Right? But if we are sensitive to others, then we stand a better chance of not doing to others what we would not do to ourselves. That's what he is talking about here. Okay. Here's another one. Then be humble. Be humble. Do nothing from what? Selfish ambition or what? Conceit. Now, this word conceit uh, translated vain glory. Um, and, and vain glory in the original language is empty glory. Which means... People who are selfish make a big deal out of nothing. Because it's all about them. Okay. But anytime it's all about us, it's nothing. Jesus okay, had all of the glory. But he humbled himself, right? He made himself of no reputation. What that means is he made himself nothing. And as a result of him making himself nothing for our sake, God has given him a name that is above every name. And he has all the glory. Which means if you make yourself nothing for the sake of others, God will glorify you. He will glorify himself in you. But if we glorify ourselves, it's empty glory. And we're the only one who's making a big deal of it. Because it's empty. It's vain. So he's saying that 
Individuals who only want to have their way is vain. It's empty. It's empty is what he's saying. Selfish ambition, conceit. He says, he says, do, do nothing from that, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. <laughs> That's a challenge, isn't it? See? Came across this quote. It says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Somebody going to post that tomorrow. Let me go and give it to you again. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Is that not Jesus? That is Jesus himself. So Paul here saying, he says, be humble here. Do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. It's a challenge to consider others more than we consider ourselves. But it is not impossible. Okay? God enables us to do it. But it, it starts with Christ like minded. I mean, you, you, it, it starts with that. Um, so this statement of summation, how did the early church turn the world upside down? By obeying a different king. And that is by standing together against external opposition with courage. That's the toughness. Okay. And serving one another in humble compassion. That's the tenderness. See. If it's hard for you to be tender with others. God will help you. Okay. If you want him to help you, he might be tough with you when you need him to be tender. I don't want that to happen. So then we want to attempt to, you know, be merciful. A lot of people want to be powerful like God. Why not be merciful like God? And don't worry about people getting away with stuff. Don't worry about that. That's not your category. That's not mine. It's not mine. Just 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 as much as it lies in you. Do 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 your very best. Don't worry about it. Okay, God will take care of all of that. Okay. All right, any questions about tenderness? Tenderness. Okay. You know, I like my steak tender. Right? But I want some juice in it. Right? And so this guy was telling me, he said, now, he said, now, I'm going to make it tender for you, but it's going to take me a little while. <laughs> and what he is saying is, you got to stay in the heat a little while. You want to be tender like Christ. He's going to provide the opportunities for you to be tender. Okay, but just know he's not going to ask you to do anything that he has not already done. Okay, nor has he not equipped you to do. All right. All right. Any questions? Okay. All right. Prayer call tomorrow morning, 630. We'll look at this last piece on don't just lie there. Get up. All right. Have a good one. Love you much. Take care. Good night.